thing you've been putting off. Maybe you say, someday I'll do that, or when I have more time. Whether the item is a big bucket list item or something smaller like going on a hike, now is the time to start your Say Yes list. And we have the perfect process to help you turn these items into reality. Join thousands of others with our free Say Yes list template at thesayyesexperience.com forward slash list. It'll help you stop living in that someday and start making those list items come true today. So download it now at thesayyesexperience.com forward slash list. Welcome to the Say Yes Experience podcast, where we inspire you to get out of your comfort zone and into possibility. Our mission at the Say Yes Experience is to empower 10 million people to say yes. If you're new here, welcome. We're thrilled you're here. I'm Just Corrector. I co-founded the Say Yes Experience with my then nine-year-old son, Blaze, based off his idea to let's just say yes to things. I'm one of the top experts on burnout, and companies and conferences hire me to present on mental health, wellness, and burnout prevention. As a number one best-selling author of 11 books, keynote speaker, and a burnout specialist, I've seen so much with our clients. The Say Yes experience was started to help you really start living, to do the things that light you up, have more fun, and turn your dreams of what we call Say Yes list items into reality. So thank you for investing in yourself and being here. Now let's make it happen. We all experience it. Yet it's something that can be challenging to discuss. As a grieving mom, Suzanne Jabor has found meaning in her loss through opening up conversations about grief, how it works, and how to support others experiencing it. As a grief educator, Suzanne helps grievers lean in and chart their unique path with grief by helping you better navigate grief and knowing what to do when others you know are experiencing it too. So please help me welcome my guest today, Suzanne Jabor. Welcome to the show, Suzanne. We're excited that you're here. Now, you are a grief and trauma educator and coach, but you took a very specific path to get there. So tell us what led you down this path of doing what you're doing now. Thank you. Thank you for having me. First of all, I'm always grateful to anyone who will open this conversation about grief, which for many of us is just terrifying and we want to run away. So thank you. I said it's important. It's an important topic. It's so important. And I promise it's not going to be heavy and awful and sad and dreary. It really, really won't. Um, So I come to this work, you know, from my own grief experience and trauma, the most recent of which was the death of my son in September of 2020 at the age of 22. And as you can imagine, that was, you know, if you can allow yourself to imagine, that was exactly as traumatic, uh, devastating, disorienting, you know, all the things as you would expect it to be. And, you know, I'm so grateful it wasn't the first person close to me that I had lost in a weird way. You know, not that I was grateful that my parents had predeceased Ben, but it wasn't the first loss of someone who was integral to my life. So that was weirdly, I think, slightly helpful. Mm-hmm. And so much of what came at me and the way that I experienced grief was things I had never experienced before. And it was, you know, as I said, as big, as d- disorienting, like I had, you know, he had died. I had completely lost my own identity. I really had to rebuild my life from what felt like nothing, what felt like this devastation. And I was stepping into like this post-apocalyptic nightmare, right? Right. But I just want to think on it was an unexpected death too. It wasn't that he'd been sick for a while and he passed away from illness. It was a completely unexpected death. And uh, how did he pass away? Um, Ben died of uh, depression and anxiety. He He died by suicide. And I, you know, literally lived that middle of the night phone call from the police nightmare that parents dread Mm -hmm. um so yeah it wasn't expected and that you know i i struggle with when we use sort of worse better language when we're talking about grief because every loss has its own Mm -hmm. you know challenges and you know disorientations but there was some there's something about an out of order death that just is different and the loss of a child that just is different and that doesn't, you know, we have this weird kind of stratification of losses and ones that we think are worthy of grief and ones that aren't. And 
you know, having suffered one of the ones that people for some reason put all, high up on that list, you know, I'm here to say that we all have things that need to be grieved. And mm. some of them are people we've lost and some of them are opportunities or experiences or our sense of normalcy, our sense of our place in the world. You know, there's so many things to be grieved and mm -hmm. we don't do a very good job of grieving any of them. Yeah, we don't. Now, while I totally get the loss of someone by suicide, my brother passed away by suicide and anyone who knows me knows that that shook myself and my family to our core, like completely yeah. unexpected middle of the night, like you said, literally middle of the night phone call. And for me, I had a young baby. And so, which was in that moment, a big blessing because I definitely understand how people could decide to crawl up in bed and never get out because when you're shook to that extent and it's that unexpected, you don't know how to start that process. You don't know mm -hmm. how to wrap your brain around that. You still expect you're going to get a call from them. We, we were actually, my mom, my sister, and I were supposed to have lunch with my brother the very next day for his 40th birthday. And you still expect to go have lunch. You still expect yeah. to call. He's going to, you know, and when holidays come around, you're expecting, I just, in my brain thought, oh, he's just on an extended vacation. Like he's going to come back, you know. And for me, it was interesting because I realized because I had a baby, I was so busy taking care of that baby. They yeah. still made the changes, don't need to be fed, so I had to get, get him to bed, that I didn't have time to grieve. I didn't have time to process that loss. And so for me, it showed up several years later. I heard a song that reminded me of my brother on the radio, and I was driving at the time, and I cried, and I just kept crying. I got home, and I was crying. I told my son, I'm going to go get in the shower. And he was about four or five at the time. And then he comes in there and he's like, are you almost done? It's been an hour. <laughs> and I hadn't even gotten in because I literally just kept crying. And and what I realized in that moment is although it was many years later, I'd never really processed it. I'd never really given myself permission to grieve. And I think a lot of people are, are in that same situation where they don't give themselves permission to grieve and take that time to process it. So then it shows up in a variety of different ways later in life, completely unexpected and floors them. And then they don't know what to do because then it's like, okay, but it happened five years ago. Why am I yeah. why is it hitting me so hard, right? Many years later. And so take us through what you found and what you discovered really worked for you when you were processing Ben passing away. And and here's why, before you answer that, Suzanne, here's why I also think it's extremely important to talk about this, the grieving period, but also share how Ben passed away. Talk about how my brother passed away because suicide is the number two cause of death for males 14 to 44. And so there's something wrong with this with what's going on in the world if it's the number two cause of death for males. And so we really, it's a topic we really need to bring to the forefront and really help our males in life get the support that they need and um, and for them to know that there's people around them that love them and they can get the help that they need as well. So I appreciate you sharing how Ben died um, because I think also the more we talk about it, the more it takes the stigma out of it as well. So back to my original question is, you know, how did you process that? How did you get through that? Um, because for me, it's something that I will never fully get over. Um, I'm not going to wake up one day and be like, oh, I'm totally over that. You know, there are days no. when it hits me harder, when I think of him more, when, you know, but there's a lot more happy memories now than it was initially for me. Yeah. I think that's so brilliant what you're talking about, giving yourself permission and the other thing I'll say just in relation to what you're saying is, you know, grief is patient. It will wait for you. Right. And you're exactly right. Like, if you don't have time at the time, it'll wait. It's just going to hang out somewhere in your body, in your brain, somewhere. And then you're going to hear that song. You're going to have a special event, whatever it is. And it's going to go, oh, it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think of it like that. But that, right? well, it's powerful to think of it like that. It'll wait. Grief is patient. It will wait for you. So I kind of had that idea. I kind of knew that. And I also was really aware that because of that weird stratification I was talking about, I would get from other people a lot of permission to be messy. 
because it's expected, right? It, my child died. That's one that we give a lot of permission to, right. even though it's not enough permission, but we give a lot of permission to that. So one of my thoughts was, I need to embrace this right now while I have some support and while I have some permission and while people are expecting me to be a hot mess because I was a hot mess. Oh my gosh. So that was part of my thinking was, okay, I need to do this now. And I also knew for me, grieving out loud was going to be the only way to survive it. There was no right. ability. So th there was no ability to like bypass any of the emotions. There was no ability to go, oh, but I'm really busy. I don't have time right now. That was not going to be survivable for me in this experience of grief. Yeah. So I had to really almost take like radical ownership of it and really just allow all of it to be all right. And I got this knowing really early on, like within days, that my survival was going to be about being conscious, which is that embracing of it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And let's be honest, at the beginning, it's mostly bad and ugly. Right. So embracing all of that, right? And just allowing that to be all right, allowing a day to be like today's accomplishment is I got up from bed and I moved to the couch and I sobbed there for an appropriate amount of time. And then I went back to bed, right? Excellent, right? So just embracing that reality. And the other thing that was going to be critical for me was being curious. So this idea of, you know, in the early days, the curiosity was literally about things like, how do I breathe? You know, when I'm curled up in a ball on the couch sobbing, doing that ugly cry, how do I oxygenate my body? Like, this is an issue. I need to breathe. And that actually became our mantra. Our, my rule for my daughter and I, she was living with me at the time, as Ben was as well was, you know, we could do one hard thing a day because you have to do all kinds of really hard things when someone dies. You have to phone strangers to tell them so you can close accounts. Like, you have to do really horrifyingly hard things. So our rule was one hard thing, and then the whole rest of the to-do list was just to breathe. Mm. So that was it. Like, I'm, okay, so you steal yourself, you, like, pull up all your resources, you plan the conversation in your head, you do the one hard thing, you ball your eyes out and then just breathe. It's like, okay. And I've done that hard thing. Now I just need to breathe. That's all I have to do today. So it really was that kind of radical, you know, facing it full on, allowing it to be the tsunami it was. You know, at the beginning, you're just spinning underwater, trying to gasp a breath when you can, right? And then you know, slowly over time, I love water metaphors. So I love the people that explained it as like a tsunami and then the waves get further and further apart. I love that. I held on to that idea really tight in the early days that like eventually these waves would be further apart and you would get to breathe in between. You know, for me, I really realized that I wasn't actually like a piece of waste from a ship that was under the water all the time. I was actually a cork. So every once in a while, I would get to bob to the surface, gasp, right? Yeah. And then back right. under I would go. But I knew that I would get another moment at the surface and that eventually, you know, I would spend more time at the surface than underwater. But it really was that radical acceptance of grief itself. Not the accept, you know, people talk about the stages, which, uh, you know, I think there's brilliance in the stages. And if you read the introduction to the book, they make it very clear they're not intended to be linear. This is things that might happen to you at some point on yeah. your grief journey in some combination, right? I'm not talking about that kind of acceptance. I'm talking about acceptance of grief and just all that it was going to bring me. And that's, and that, I think, I think, Suzanne, sometimes people fear grief. Absolutely. Like, what, is it, what does it mean if I grieve? What, what does that mean about me? Especially a person, right? What does that mean about me? What does that mean about the relationship I had with this person? What does that mean about the other person? Does that mean that I have to let them go? Does that mean I have to move on? Does that mean, you know, and there's just so much uncertainty, I think, around grief. And I think part of that also is because everybody does it differently, right? Everybody mm -hmm. does grief differently. Some people do it out loud and yeah, like, here I am and you know I'm grieving. Other people do it in silence where they don't want anybody to know their pain. They don't want anybody to see them. And there's no right way to grieve. Everybody has their own way in their own process. 
But I think there's a lot of fear around it. 100%. And when I talk to people, because I work a lot with people who want to support someone who's grieving better, the thing that holds us back from grief for everybody, for the person experiencing it and the people trying to support them is fear. That's 100% what it is. We're scared of being overwhelmed by our emotions, right? Like what, like I can sense that these emotions are really big. And if I allow them, if I feel that pain, mm -hmm. that overwhelm, that despair, that sadness, that longing, you know, there's so many emotions. Yeah. My daughter so succinctly described it as all the emotions all the time, which is oh, pretty God. much what it is, right? We have fear about that because we have fear of emotions. So, <laughs> you know, that's a good point. If we can't get really comfortable with emotions, then it's hard to get comfortable with our grief. So for me, I decided that grief was going to be my radical teacher about emotions. And I was going to have to step even further into owning mine, allowing them to be, you know, accepting the ones, you know, we have this weird paradigm around emotions that there's like good emotions. Those are the ones as kids we were like encouraged to feel happy, joyful, gratitude, all that stuff. And there's bad emotions. Well, in grief, this is all of them, right? They're all from the bad, you know, the so-called bad list or negative list, which I think is a whole big problem that we have this paradigm of positive and negative emotions. Emotions are all messages. Mm -hmm. They're all messages with something to teach us. And I think your sense of, you know, that curiosity, like, so I'm feeling loneliness for my person, what does that say about me? What does that say about my relationship with them? What does that say? Like, what if we turned towards that? And what if we asked all of those questions? And what if we talked with other people about their the experience, thing. right? And how are they making sense of it? You know, it's this weird place that we have silence. And so because we don't talk about it, mm -hmm. when we're in grief ourselves, we're shocked and surprised and we think there's something wrong with us and we don't know what's happening. But everything that's happening to us has happened to other people. We just don't know that because they're not talking about it. Do you want to start saying yes, but you just don't know where to start? And oftentimes when we don't know where to start, we just don't start. So we created an ebook just for you. We put together 101 ways to say yes in this ebook. Ideas, big and small, things that only take a small amount of time, like one to two minutes. Whether you're saying yes to yourself, in your family, relationships, or pushing yourself a lovingly outside of your comfort zone with adventures, it's all made to really help you become more of your rock star self. So you can get this ebook at thesayyesexperience.com forward slash book, B-O-O-K. So if you want to start saying yes, or maybe you need some ideas on how to say yes, because you get so caught up in being busy and doing tasks and projects or doing laundry and cooking that the time flies by and you want to spend time with your family, but you just don't know how to say yes. Those ideas just don't come to you. We put it together to make it super, super easy for you. So go to thesayyesexperience.com forward slash book to get your copy today and start saying yes now. Are you feeling overwhelmed, stressed, or burned out? We get it. You're not alone. In fact, according to our research, 79% of the workforce is in burnout and almost half are in extreme burnout. In fact, it's the number one reason why people are leaving organizations. They're burned out. They're looking for something more. They're looking for something better. But it doesn't have to be that way. We have your solution. It's called Blaze Your Brain to Extinguish Burnout. 52 Keys to Prevent, Breakthrough, and Eliminate Burnout. You can find your copy at jessicarector.com forward slash store. Now, this is a great tool that you can use with yourself, with your colleagues, within your organization. Everyone can get one and you can go through one a week with them. And at the end, you can say, what was something that worked this week? What was the success you had? So you can champion and encourage each other. You can also ask, what were the challenges and issues that came up? 
so you can mastermind and brainstorm around those to keep those from coming up in the future. So make sure you get your copy at justcorrector.com forward slash store. All books are autographed with a personal message just for you. So if we talk, I like talk, I like talking about it. I like talking about my brother. I like, you know, yeah. remembering, you know, him and good memories and fun times and stuff I had with him because he was only a year older than me. And just mm. like things when, you know, growing up, we we're super close. And so like we'd go to school and people often would say, hey, are you Jeff's twin? And uh, I'd be like, oh, oh. Uh, no, I miss this thing though because we looked so much alike, you know. And oftentimes, when someone knew one of us, they knew the other one, right? Um, yeah. Again, because we we're just a year apart. So, uh, you know, uh, the next year I was going, I continued to school. The next year I was there, you know. We had similar teachers, stuff like that. And so I like talking about those things, but I also don't know where that safe place is where I can go and talk about him, go and express mm. that, right? Because when you're wanting, when you're working through grief and you're wanting to talk about someone, you know, and I think grief is an ongoing thing. I mean, yeah. it's been um, almost 10 years since he's passed away, God, even though I can't believe it's been that long, but it's been almost 10 years. And yet, again, like I said, there's still times that'll come up. I'll be fine talking about it one minute, and then the next minute I'll start to cry, you know? And so, but I like talking about him. It brings up really great really great memories, but I also don't know where that safe place is, especially right when he passed. I didn't yeah. know that safe place that you could go to, to talk about it and to be met with compassion, meaning that other people that were also grieving him may not want to talk about it, right? Because yes. it's painful and it hurts too much. And then, so maybe you didn't feel like you could go and talk to him with that person. And then when you talk to him with someone else, you didn't really know him. It's like, but you didn't really know him. So, you know, it's not the same. <laughs> so where do you go and find that place that is safe for you, whatever that looks like, whether you want to talk about it or you don't want to talk about it? Like, where do you go and find that through the process of grieving? Yeah. And that's so important because grief needs to be witnessed. So we do need to find community. We need to find those places where we can grieve however we want to. And as you say, be re be received with compassion. So for me, I mean, there's all kinds of options. There's online communities. Uh, for me, I didn't. I wasn't looking for a group. I didn't want to sit around with a bunch of other people having their own grief experience. I just needed to be really centered in mine and in supporting my daughter. That was my. I didn't have any space for anybody else's grief, yeah. especially in those early days. I was really lucky to find. I think because I was grieving out loud and people, so people knew that I was talking about it and knew I wanted to talk about it. Yeah. I was really lucky to find about three friends who, you know, so a couple were in my sort of real inner circle, some were more peripheral friendships before Ben died, but who were really able to just show up in that space of compassion. Yeah. Right. And that space of just acknowledging that it's messy and it's a little bit scary and none of us really know how to do it. And, you know, even though that's true, I'm still here for you, right? I'm here and we'll figure it out together. And interestingly, it was all people who had had close losses. So all the people who, you know, when I think about it now, I kind of, and, I, and I'm so focused on, you know, how can I help people support each other better? Yeah. I really look at, you know, who was able to show up for me and who that I expected to show up for me disappeared. And one of the commonalities is the people who were able to show up had all suffered close losses. Mm. And the people who didn't, hadn't. Like many of my friends still had both their parents. I didn't have either of my parents, but many of my friends still had both. So they hadn't even lost a parent yet. So mm. they had really not experienced the kind of grief that I was experiencing. And there's something about having done it yourself that really allows you to show up in a way you know, I think we're all showing up in the way that we wish other people had done for us, right? right? So we all have this kind of sense of, wow, I really wish that people had done X, Y, or Z. And we sh and so then we try to do those things. So I would say if you're looking for support, I mean, you can find a professional, you can find a grief coach like me, and then look among your circle of friends and acquaintances for people who you know have had significant losses. 
and you can do a soft reach out to them. You know, that's a really, you know, there's a lot of potential within our own communities to find that support. And when it's not there, absolutely look for, you know, a group. There's every kind of group right now, especially because so many are online, Mm -hmm. that you can find an online group. You can find a grief expert or coach that, you know, that is trained in how to hold that space for you. And, and who's okay with being uncomfortable with emotions and okay Definitely. on it and okay. And who understands that this is ongoing. You know, for me, my goal is not to get over it or get mm-hmm. through it or move past it. That's not even part of what I contemplate because all of that sends the subtext message that you're supposed to leave your experience, leave that experience behind you, which implies you're leaving your person behind you. Well, none of us want to do that. So exactly. what I talk about is integration. You know, we want to get to integration where I'm moving forward with this loss, with this hole in my life. And I'm building a life that acknowledges that hole. Yeah. You know, I don't expect that hole to get filled in. There's no one else that can fill that exactly. place in my life. So, true. Mm-hmm. so that hole's not getting filled in. I'm not trying to stuff it full of anything else. I'm just building a life around it where that hole is there. I that. Like integration. I, I love yeah. it because I'll talk. So my, my son was you know, like not even 10 months old when my brother passed, but I'll talk about Jeff and I'll say his name. And so, you know, my son gets familiar with them and my son's, you know, 10 now. And so he knows, he knows Jeff by name and I'll show him pictures and stuff. There's pictures on my refrigerator and stuff of Jeff. But my son had this a school assignment where he had to list the people in your family. And so oh, oh, it was a dreaded me. family tree assignment. So yeah, terrible. like these teachers stop it. Me and his grandpa and his grandma and his aunts and his uncle. And then he also listed Uncle Jeff. And I was like, oh, I love that. Like just so cute. I brought to, like my I started crying because I was just like, like, how cute is that? He's never met him. He only knows him through what I share and what I tell him. But still he he recognizes that this person that he's never met was valuable to be in had this special place in my heart that he even put it down as someone of his family. You know, so I love when you're talking about this whole and like integrating it. Yeah. And we're not trying to erase that person. We're not trying to move on from them. You know, we want them to show up on the family tree. And, you know, Jessica, I just have to say that's a tribute to you. And how you grieve and integrated Jeff into your life, right? Because your son, when he thinks of his family tree and who's in his family, knows this person is in his family. Yeah, That's beautiful. That should be what we're aiming for, right? Not We're not trying to leave them behind or pretend they were never there. We yeah. want them to be part of our life. We want to stay connected to them. And there's ways to do that. We can talk about them. We can share memories. You know, my daughter and I have all kinds of ways on you know, special occasions or when we go on vacation, you know, that we bring Ben with us and we think of, you know, oh my gosh, what would he think of that? And, you know, oh, he'd have a lot to say about that, right? He had all kinds of opinions, most of them, you know, he would always say, yeah, mom, because I'm right. And I'm like, ugh, I know it's so annoying, right? But he almost always was, right? Yes. So we stop the way that we can bring them with us because they're not, you know, we want them 10 years later, 20 years later. I want Ben to feel like a part of my life for the rest of my life. Absolutely. So how do I do that? How do I get, you know, to me, you know, David Kessler is a brilliant uh, grief expert and he talks about when you think of the person having more love than pain. Mm. So that to me is the ticket, right? More love than pain. And love doesn't look like you don't well up every once in a while, right? Or that when you think of this incredibly moving thing that your son did, you don't get weepy. That's perfectly normal. We need to normalize that. Mm -hmm. Right? Like that should be expected when we have those moments of, and that's not a moment of pain. That's a moment of love. Yeah. But, you know, love still sometimes shows up as water out of our eyes, and that's all right. Absolutely. But, you know, it's fascinating just as you say that, that my first thought is, is when, when I am with someone else and they're thinking of someone who's passed away or something that they're grieving and their eyes start to well up, they immediately say, oh, I'm sorry. And they start apologizing. And why are they apologizing because of it? And it just goes to show like we as a society need to normalize that 
to be for people to be able to feel comfortable talking about it, to expressing their emotions in whatever way suits them at that time without feeling the need to apologize. Yeah, because, you know, if grief is going to happen to all of us, it is happening. I mean, right now it yeah. has happened to all of us. We are all in it and we're not talking about it and we're not acknowledging it and we're not letting those emotions flow, right? We are all expert stuffers of emotions, right? It's certainly in North America. We are. Oh, that's our go-to, oh, man. Oh, no, I'm not feeling that. Everything I'm looks good. How are you? I'm good. The life's amazing. It's wonderful. It's, it's so toxic, right? And, and I think when we talk about, you know, the rates of deaths by suicide, that is a huge part of it, right? A huge part of it is that we're all trying to perform to an unsustainable and actually not real experience, right? None of us are showing our true selves. So, you know, that's a step we can all decide to take together is, you know, if we're going to open ourselves up to speak with someone who's grieving, which I hope we all would, we need to understand and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. Because right now, as a collective, those big emotions make us all uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. so As a griever, I'm uncomfortable. As the person standing there watching them, they're, we're uncomfortable. We need to just all then be comfortable with being uncomfortable. What do we say to someone, Suzanne? Like, talk about, like, being uncomfortable. Oftentimes, when someone's grieving, we don't know what to say. We don't want to say the wrong thing. So then we just don't say anything. And then we're not having that conversation that we need to have. They don't know that we're there to support them because we don't know what to say or how to say it or what to do, what not to do. So what what's a place like that that we can start? So, yes, exactly that. And then time passes and now we haven't said anything and now it's even more uncomfortable and now we're all isolated and we yeah, and shame. Yeah, you know, we haven't said anything and oh my gosh, I'm not a really good friend because I didn't say anything because I didn't know what to say and, you know, yeah. Yeah, then we're all in shame-based meaning making and nobody can learn anything when you're in shame-based meaning making. So what we're going to do instead is... Just embrace that uncomfortable thought. It's going to be uncomfortable and you're not going to do it perfectly. And that's okay because perfection is an illusion anyway. Yes. So if we can go heart-centered. So what I say to people is you have to get out of your head because your head wants you to come up with the perfect thing to say. Mm -hmm. There's no perfect thing to say. Mm -hmm. I wish I had come up with the one-size-fits-all perfect thing to say to a griever. It doesn't exist because mm -hmm. it's different every time. It's different for each person. It doesn't exist. If you can go heart-centered and speak what's true from your heart, mm -hmm. I believe you can do no harm, which is ultimately our goal. We all want to do no harm. Right. So if you are in that heart center, you're thinking, I'm just going to speak my truth. What if you said something like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to say. What I can say is, I'm so sorry this has happened. It's absolutely terrible. And I'm here for you. Whatever that looks like, as you figure it out, you know, I'm going to touch base every once in a while and just reach out to you. And I don't expect you to answer me, but that's how I'll show you that I'm here. No, oh, I love that. Yeah. Cause then there what if you said something like that? Yeah. And not those exact words, because that's my words. I just made up right now. So, but it's about like, what from my heart would I say to this person? Because it's going to be different with each person you're talking to, too, right? Your best friend, we're going to say something different to you than your word me, right? Yeah. Even what would I want someone to say to me in in that instance, you know, and then say that to someone else, yeah. like, what is it that you would want? Yeah. I and I think we all have a knowing that, like, those old platitudes and cliches all don't serve. Like, we just need to write them all down and have a ceremonial burning together and just agree we're never going to say them because they're... Yeah. At best neutral but most of the time harmful like most of the time they're hurtful yeah so we just have to let them all go and understand that there is no perfect thing the yeah. perfect thing is what's genuinely from your heart to reach out in support and compassion I love that. that's the perfect thing thank you so much for sharing that Suzanne and thank you so much for being here and it's such an important topic that we need to bring to the limelight bring to the front and start sharing more about it and start being there for other people even if we don't have because we never will have the no. most perfect <laughs> thing to say but we just need to lean into that uncomfortableness is that even a word uncomfortable discomfort i think yeah i think it's discomfort yeah uncomfortability i'm like making yeah, up my own words here we need to lean into the discomfort more and the more we do that we'll also become more comfortable doing it right letting exactly. people we're there to support and encourage them 
So if you want some more information on Suzanne and how she can help you with your grief and trauma, all her information will be in the show notes. So make sure that you reach out to her. And if you know somebody who's going through grief and trying to process it, just like Suzanne said, come from a heart center, figure out what it is that you would like to say from your heart to them, get out of your head and into your heart and, uh, and serve them. And they will, at the end of that, appreciate that, knowing that you support them and that they'll be met with compassion, empathy, and understanding. And if you're going through grief yourself, just know there's no right way to go through it. And it's a process. And be patient with yourself and give yourself grace. We'll see you on the next one. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye. Are you ready to move to your next level of rock star greatness? CFO, Chief Fund Officer, number one best-selling author, and keynote speaker, Blaze Rector, is ready to help you do that. At just 10 years old, he's already written two number one best-selling books. Through the power of storytelling, he uses lessons learned and shares strategies, tips, tactics, and tools to inspire, empower, and motivate you to live a more amazing life. So if you're ready to do that in your own life, grab a copy of his number one best-selling books at justcorrector.com forward slash store. And when you order your copies, he will personally autograph them and write you a message on those books before shipping them out to you to really inspire and empower you in your life. These books are great for adults, and kids alike. So if you're ready to move to your next level of rock star greatness, make sure you grab your copy at justcorrector.com forward slash store. Enjoy those amazing, empowering, transformational books. Did you know that the two biggest issues impacting the workforce are mental health and burnout? Well, we have your solution. The more that you feel burned out, the more it impacts your mental health. The more your mental health is impacted, the more it leads to burnout. So it's a vicious cycle that goes around and around, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can help them both if you're intentional and strategic with it. We have lots of resources for you at justcorrector.com forward slash store. One that I wanna highlight that really enhances your mental health is Tame Your Brain Game, 52 Tips to Turn Negative Thoughts into Positive Action. Now, research shows that 80% of your thoughts are negative. No matter how positive you feel, it's the pattern and the habit that you've developed over the course of years, over the course of decades. And that can often impact your life, how you show up, how you lead, how you communicate, how you engage, whether at work or at home. And then it also impacts a work environment. All you need is one NN or TT, negative Nancy or toxic Tim to really impact that work environment. So if you are ready to enhance your mental health, get your copy of Tame Your Brain Game, 52 Tips to Turn Negative Thoughts into Positive Action today at justcorrector.com forward slash store. All books are autographed with a personal message just for you. Thank you so much for being here. Check us out at thesayyesexperience.com. Our mission at the Say Yes Experience is to empower 10 million people to say yes. With your help in sharing our podcast, we can do that. Follow us on all social media at the Say Yes Experience and join our free community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the Say Yes Experience. Thank you again to our guests. You can find all the contact information for our guests in the show notes. Thank you to our CFO, Chief Fund Officer, Blaze Rector, our business advisor, Lisa Verhurek, and to our team at Jessica Rector Enterprises. We look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Have an amazing day and keep being a rock star.